Right, I uh, hope everyone can see the uh, slide and uh, it's uh, a picture of HMSCS Afterglow at Roy Cove taken in the 1920s. It's very evocative of the era, I think. Uh, wonderful photograph. Uh, and it shows some of the mail schooners and ships that were vital for mail to and from West Falkland. Um, I've always had an interest in, in collecting West Falkland. I, I can remember going around dealers back in the 70s and they always had sort of West Falkland and, and New Island cancellations at, at no premium as, as they are now with the Heights catalogue to the ordinary cancellations. And a few years back, I, I, I decided to sell some of my South Georgia to concentrate on West Falkland mail. And uh, that built on some purchases I've made from Stefan a few years back and uh, Mike Roberts I'm, I made recently and also some from uh, Ray Riddle Carr. So uh, it's an interesting area and I hope you enjoy the presentation uh, today. What we're looking at is uh, we're going to have a look at some very early uh, American whaling mail and it was sent from New Ireland. I, I'll explain that. Then we look at a, a short lived contract for carrying mail between East and West Falkland with Cosmos between 1882 and 1885. Show you some direct mail to West Falkland from South America. Then we move into the period of various schooners, either the government ones or Falkland Island Company ones providing the mail service. That went on until 1910 and linked to the opening of the New Island Post Office. There was a mail contract uh, with Salvesons and Co. And uh, we'll have a look at that. And then the other two ships that were interwoven into the uh, story, RMS Falkland and the Afterglow we saw previously. And it finishes with another look at the Falkland coming back to provide the mail service up until 1930 when this presentation ends. And here you see an early whaling letter that was sent by Captain Arthur Cox to his wife Julia in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. And uh, thanks to uh, Rafe that I had uh, acquired this and it's uh, dated the 19th of January 1838. And you can see on the right hand side there says N Island, uh, it's sent from New Island. He was on board the whaler Francis that was down there. And it's carried back to the United States by the Cicero that departed New Island in January, 1838. And uh, headed back to New, uh, to New York where it arrived uh, on the 23rd of April. So you can see the time taken to, to sail back up the Atlantic and arrived at New Bedford on uh, April the 30th. The, uh, uh, the Cicero, but probably dropped the mail off at, uh, say, at New York, and that's why there's a receiver there of April the 23rd. Um, this cover, uh, you probably have just read about it because it was written up in the last uh, last Upland Goose you received, and it's, a, it's an interesting cover. It was addressed to Ernest Holmstead. Uh, it says Adelaide Station, and that was the name of the house at Shallow Bay in West Falkland. Uh, and Ernest Holmstead was very involved with Patagonia. Uh, he sent sheep uh, to and from Patagonia. And this is from Sandy Point, which you know, know better as Punta Arenas. And it's from the PSNC agent, Wehan and Co. And it has a cachet on the back, which uh, helps. And we've tracked it down to being sent by the agent there, who's Rodolfo Steubenrauch. And he sent the uh, letter to Holmstead and it went, as you can see at the top of the envelope, by favour of Captain Hansen on the schooner foam. And that's quite a famous uh, yacht that uh, was up in the UK and then sailed down to the Falkland Islands. Uh, and Hansen was the captain of that. And there's a picture there of the foam. Now, here's a nice pairing because I talked about the first contract to take mail between East and West Falkland that, that wasn't by sort of favour of, of captains carrying mail. And Cosmos had got the uh, contract to take the mail to and from Europe to the Falkland Islands. And uh, here they extended the service to do a, a service uh, to take mail, the freight, parcels and passengers between the islands. And uh, they brought down a ship, SS Malvina, so that arrived to carry out this task. It was first registered in September 1882. 
And here's an example of a letter on a Cosmos Agency envelope. And you can see this annotated pair Malvinus. And it's noted Captain Zeman who on, on the reverse. And I think he was the first uh, Cosmos agent before Schottfeld uh, in Stanley for the Cosmos Agency. Now, the interesting thing about this is the battle lines were really drawn up with the Falkland Islands Company, who didn't really like Cosmos muscling in on their activity in the islands. And therefore, I think they worked with some of the settlers to make sure that this wasn't a very popular service. And it only lasted until 1885 and wasn't renewed. And the FIC really took over uh, providing the mail service at that time. So local schooners, uh, there wasn't any official mail between the uh, two islands until 1891, and therefore mail was handed to the captains, and these FIC schooners going around off the, the mail service to take mail to West Falkland and from West Falkland. And there's a nice old photo here of a typical FIC schooner. It's the Hornet, owned by the FIC, as you can see annotated at the bottom there. And the other uh, items on this page, there's a 1904 inter-island mail to uh, charters. Uh, that's quite nice. And any inter-island mail between East and West Falkland and vice versa is pretty scarce. You don't see a lot of it. So here's, here's an example here in 1904. And on the left is an item where I suspect the captain cancelled a West Falkland mail that never reached Stanley. It was probably dropped off at one of the other settlements before they got to Stanley. And therefore, to ensure that the stamp was cancelled, it was overwritten schooner Fair Rosamond, West Falkland, mail, 8th of October, 1898. A nice example of a piece there of, of a cancellation of a, a schooner mail. Uh, here's uh, some nice inward mail to Ernest Holmstead at Shallow Bay again, and it's unusual and it's from Cape Verde and it's a 30 rice postcard rate. It's cancelled the 4th of August and it has a Buenos Aires transit uh, ca cancel of the 27th of August 1887. It arrived in Stanley on September the 5th 1887 when an FIC boat would have brought it from Montevideo. And it's an unusual route that it took to get to Buenos Aires because at that time, of course, we saw the Cosmos line bringing mail down, but uh, they never called at Cape Verde. So this was carried by a Lamport and Holt line that sailed from Liverpool to Buenos Aires, but went via Cape Verde. So it's an unusual item in that respect as well. Here's some inward mail and this time it's to Port Howard. Uh, the top right, we have a London 1884 envelope. Uh, it was uh, cancelled May the 10th, as you can see in London, and it arrived in Stanley on June the 15th uh, when the Camber Seas arrived, a Cosmos ship. Uh, it was then probably, we're looking at 1884, so it could well have been carried by Malvinus to Port Howard under the Cosmos uh, contract. Uh, so it could be another example of Malvinus mail, but of course it's not annotated as such. At the bottom right, we have a newspaper wrapper, which is at the one centavo rate, but it also has a one centavo stamp added for uplift to foreign rate for newspapers. You can see the address is quite unusual in that it says Fort Howard rather than Port Howard. But uh, it uh, is dated the 5th of February, 1888, and it arrived in Stanley on the 16th of February. And on the left hand side there, from Wallingford, we have a cover dated, unusually, Boxing Day, the 26th of December, 1898. And it arrived in, the, in Stanley on the 2nd of February, 1899, on board the uh, Cosmos ship Ammon. Uh, so three nice examples there of Paul Howard Mail. Uh, and something else unusual as well is a bisect cover uh, from West Falkland that originated in West Falkland. It's from uh, uh, Blake at Hill Cove uh, to his partner Holmstead in London. So Holmstead and Blake ran, ran Hill Cove and Shallow Bay. And you can see on the back, I, I put a, an image there, the back there, which has Blake's January the 25th, 1891. It's Barton 
listing B6 in Malcolm's excellent uh, book on the bisect covers. If you're interested at all in Queen Victoria, that's, that's well worth getting. The other interesting thing about it is that it's surcharge stamps. Um, so they must have either been put on at uh, Stanley Post Office or bought from Stanley Post Office and taken to West Falkland. I suspect they were probably put on at Stanley Post Office and there with a nice uh, uh, cancellate, uh, court cancellation as well. And there's a picture so of Blake and his wife, uh, Dora, uh, and that would have left on the SS Dendro, which left on the 13th of February and arrived in London on the 21st of March, 1891. Now I mentioned intertwined with the story of the, the schooners was the opening of uh, Fox Bay post office. And here's one that came from the Stephen Heights collection. And uh, to the left there, you see a notice in the uh, Falkland Islands Gazette of the 8th of May, 1899 saying that the Fox Bay post office would open on July the 1st. Now, when the post office opened, it had its own councillor, like the F1 council, but with the W, you can see the dot W dot on the right hand side of the council there. Uh, they had an obliterator also, like the uh, 278 Falkland Islands obliter obliterator, but that said WFI, and they had their own registration hand stamp as well, and we'll come on to that. So this is uh, an, uh, uh, an early item from the post office. It's a Queen Victoria postcard and it was posted November the 25th, 1899. Now the schooner Chance arrived in Stanley on the 4th of December and then uh, Modestia left for London on the 12th of December and arrived the 17th of January, 1900. So uh, yeah, unfortunately it was in, in 1900 in January that it arrived and the message on the back says Merry Christmas from Sarah. So it's a little bit late, but I guess it got there in the end, all the way from West Falkland to London. I mentioned the Fox Bay registration marking, and here's a couple of registered items to Og Brothers. And they were mail, oil, uh, mail order drapery in Glasgow. Um, you may well have seen other items to Og Brothers as well. On the bottom left, you can see uh, the Crown registered marking at Fox Bay and it's distinguishable from the uh, Stanley one and it has a crown, a, a cross on the top of the crown, which you don't see on the Stanley one. Uh, so that distinguishes the, the fact that that was registered and uh, hand stamped in Fox Bay. And the item on the left pays the penny empire rate plus tuppence registration. Uh, it's cancelled West Falkland 21st of May 1902 uh, and I got that one in uh, Grosvenor I think last September as an unsold lot and it goes quite nicely with the one on the right which is slightly different because it's a Queen Victoria penny letter card and it's had two penny stamps added to make up the registration fee and the penny empire rate again. It's cancelled the 28th of April 1902 and then uh, it uh, went on board Oropisa, uh, arrived on the 24th of June uh, in, in uh, London uh, and then went off to Glasgow as well. Now, from 1904 to 1914, there was a pretty sporadic post office service at Fox Bay. Uh, the doctor had a, a lot of uh, things to do and he didn't really want to be a postmaster at the same time. <laughs> However, there was some money orders issued by the doctor at, at uh, Fox Bay and also registered uh, letters with, with the money orders in. But the, most of the cancelling and the real regi registration of the envelopes between 1904 and 1914 took place at Stanley. And there's two examples here, both to D.H. Evans department store in Oxford Street. The top right was cancelled in Stanley on March the 23rd, 1908. And uh, then Oriana carried it back to London, arriving the 18th of April, 1908. Bottom left is December the 2nd, 1907. And that would have arrived uh, in London on the 28th of December, uh, 1907. So again, quite a fast transit period of uh, 26 days for this uh, item. 
Here's a couple of postcards that went to Fox Bay. Uh, the top right was during the interim period of the uh, post office. Uh, and it's sent to Fox Bay East, and that's where the post office is uh, in Fox Bay, uh, to the Buckworth House. And it's got a Sheffield thimble cancel of October the 22nd, 1908, with a receiver of November the 18th. And it's to Bella Stewart, who is one of the servant girls at uh, the Buckworth House. Now, the Buckworth House was destroyed by fire in 1914, and it was unusual in that it was a Crimean hut that uh, was used in the Crimean uh, War uh, for soldiers, and it was later transported to the islands, and there was another one at Port Howard as well. Now, the one on the bottom right there is to the smaller settlement of Fox Bay West, just across the bay from Fox Bay East. And it's unusual in that it's come from Australia. Cancelled the 21st of December 1914 in Mossvale. And this arrived in Fox Bay after the post office had reopened. And it's got a receiver of March the 21st, 1915. Uh, so it took three months to get from Australia to uh, the Falkland Islands, not too bad in, uh, in the time. And also remember as well, that that was during the First World War. Now, there was many complaints about the West, uh, the, from the Westers about the schooner mail service. Uh, a PSNC uh, steamer uh, would uh, sail to the West sometimes, but otherwise uh, the mail was provided by the sailing ships and is unreliable. So the 1909 was the last uh, year of the schooner mail service. And you can see the timetable there. Uh, now it ended up being a three year contract, but you can see the tender there on the right uh, asked for a three or five year contract. And there was a Gazette notice in 1909 for the uh, inter-island mail service to start in 1910. So, uh, Salverson's got the contract uh, and a major decision point for that was the opening of the New Island Post Office in 1909. Salverson's would then have a number of steam whaling vessels who were around who could provide the service. The post office opened in New Island in July 1909 with the N1 cancel, which is basically the F4A cancel from Stanley with no date stamp in the middle. So postmaster Arthur Kerwin, who was the first postmaster at New Island, wrote the date in. By November 1909, the N2 cancel, which is a full New Island cancel, had arrived. So there was only a few months, <coughs> excuse me, when uh, this cancel was used. And there's a couple of examples here. There's a Tupney Apney foreign rate where the manuscript writing of New Island is in capitals, and that's dated the 31st of August, 1909. Also, we have a penny rate postcard, foreign postcard rate, where it's canceled the 18th of uh, October, 1909, but you can see New Island is written in manuscript, not in capitals there. And this time, the whale catcher Swona was carrying mail from New Island to Stanley. So as I say, Salverson's got the contract for inter-island mail in 1910 uh, using the whalers or supply steamers. The schedule was pretty regular, but you can also see at the bottom there of the schedule on the right hand side, there was a three monthly call at Port Stephens, Port Howard, Hill Cove and West Point. Otherwise, they'd have to take their mail uh, in the meantime to New Island or to Fox Bay or have a passing schooner pick it up. There's a 1910 example here of a postcard with the new N2 New Island cancellor, cancelled July the 6th, 1910. Now it's an unusual postcard, I need to do some more research on it because it's to an interesting address which is Iceland um, and the whaling station at New Island actually came from Iceland. So this is either from a worker who stayed on or to maybe a friend of a worker who was at New Island still in 1910. I say some more research needs to be done on that, but an interesting destination for New Island mail. Now, as I said previously, inter-island mail is pretty scarce 
And here's some examples to and from New Island between uh, Stanley and New Island. Now, the, there's one from Edward Binney, signed EBB at the bottom of the postcard there at the bottom left, to George Scott. And that's from Stanley to New Island. It's got a nice New Island receiver of May the 11th, 1912. The top right one, a little bit soiled, but it's a wonderful postcard. And it's to Thomas Binney, who ran a tailoring and haberdashery store in Stanley. And it's from uh, Tom, uh, and it's dated 3rd of November, 1915. And the message says, make up a suit for that chap, dark preferred, hang on to mine at present. And the rest of the postcard goes into electrical rewiring probably for uh, hack the house here. And I, I got that one also at uh, Grover in September 2020, a, a nice item there of inter-island mail. Now, perhaps the most famous New Island cancelled stamp isn't a Falkland Islands one. You might think it's a chilli stamp that's been cancelled, but it's not really strictly a, a chilli stamp either because it's overwritten in manuscript on the stamp Isla de Pascua, and that's Easter Island. The Yule Pandora had sailed from Bunbury in Western Australia and had got to Easter Island uh, and obviously applied this stamp there, didn't post it there. And then uh, amazingly, looking at the photograph of the Pandora to the left there, they'd actually attempted to sail around Cape Horn. Uh, they got dismasted there and they were found and towed to New Island. And obviously, the, uh, uh, the cover was posted at New Island. The stamp wasn't recognised and the T marking was applied in Stanley. And then a further tuppence to pay was applied in London with the FB, Foreign Branch, cachet uh, as part of the councillor there. Now, the story about the Pandora is, is rather sad. As I said, they'd set uh, all the way from uh, Western Australia. They got all the way to New York. Uh, and then, unfortunately, they set sail for the UK and it, they got lost. The yacht was uh, uh, sunk and uh, lives lost uh, between New York and London. So uh, that's what happened to the uh, uh, Yule Pandora. Under the Salveson contract, uh, a boat RMS Columbus arrived to provide the mail service uh, between Stanley, Fox Bay, New Island and the other settlements. Uh, she arrived on the 1st of April 1911 from Buenos Aires. And just to give you some size, she, uh, of idea of size, she had a crew of 14 and was 168 tonnes. Uh, no covers are known from the Columbus, but there is a, a cancel that's on pieces and uh, you can see it's posted on board RMS Columbus. Now actually the Columbus provided uh, a pretty unreliable service and in August 1913 she was taken out of service due to a boiler having issues and Hanker, uh, a whaler, was used instead to provide the mail service. So this cancellation here is the 23rd of October 1913 and the Hanker would have carried that rather than Columbus because she was in dry dock at the time. Eventually, the Columbus provided uh, proved so unreliable, she was towed to England by the factory ship Nico in April 1914. There she was repaired and renamed Risby and lasted all the way until 1926 when she foundered in the North Sea, carrying a, ca uh, a cargo of herrings. So an unusual fishy end for the Columbus. Following on from the Columbus was the RMS Falkland. And again, no covers are known uh, with the RMS Falkland uh, cancellation. But she was purchased by the FIC to co cover the local mail contract. They took over from the Salvesons contract. She arrived on the 5th of February 1914 and started with a trip to Port Howard on the 19th. And she was captained by Captain Sarnham, who also captained the Columbus. And the old Columbus councillor uh, was used again, the Oval Council, but the ship name of Columbus was filed out. And then in addition, they added a straight line RMS Falkland Council as well, which was used. Now to get the complete combination of the Oval Council and RMS Falkland, 
you really need to get a piece to get a complete cancel. Uh, and there's uh, some nice examples here. Now here's a cover uh, from West Point Island, and this would have been carried by RMS Falkland under the contract here. Uh, the house at West Falkland was known as Clifton Station, and there's a scarce cachet there of Clifton Station dated the 22nd of April. It was actually cancelled at Stanley on May the 7th. Um, it would have been carried, as I say, by the Falkland, and then the Orissa left for the UK on the 12th of May. Now, the sender of this was uh, pictured there on the bottom left, uh, Arthur Felton, who lived at West Point Island. He was a superb naturalist. And many of you may have heard the name if you collect the flowers set, because the five shilling carries Felton's flower on the five shilling issue. So many uh, naturalists visited West Point Island uh, when they were down there. And Felton obviously had a lot of correspondence with uh, various people. And here you can see it's going to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now this again is carried by the Falklands. I, I particularly like this ex uh, example. It came from the Peter Cottis cell. It was probably the number one item I wanted to get from that because besides being inter-island mail, it's also on a registered envelope and uh, it, it's uh, registered mail, which is nice. Um, it's again to T. Binney that we mentioned earlier, and it says Haberdashery Millinery Store. And uh, again, it's cancelled this time by the Fox Bay Councillor on the 2nd of September, 1915. And if I'm writing up these covers, it's often nice if you can find an advert, if it's addressed to a, a shop or a, a mail order business. And here was a, 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 an advert from 1915, uh, for T and N Binney uh, Tailors uh, at uh, Stanley, and uh, you can read that there. Now, when we got to 1922, uh, a ship Afterglow arrived as a sealing protection this uh, vessel, and it was an Admiralty Drifter that had been registered in the UK, and she'd sailed down, uh, probably towed alongside a whaler to to the islands. And uh, she came on board to uh, be a sealing protection vessel and carry the inter-island mail. Three types of cancel have been seen. And the one you're probably most familiar with is the one in the middle there, the oval HMCS afterglow cancel. On the left is probably an example from very early on in the afterglow's career, where again, a letter would have been uh, dropped off before it got to Stanley post office. So the captain has just written HMS Afterglow over the stamp to cancel it. So it would have been settlement mail that never reached Stanley. On the right hand side, there was also a straight line cancel HOCS Afterglow. And here it's unusual, it's on a sixpenny stamp. So in January 1923, the government formalized the gunner of the Afterglow being the mail officer. Now, the reason it was the gunner was the captain himself had too much to do on arriving at a settlement. So you can see here in the notice that Afterglow would carry stamp mail, but it would cancel the stamps, especially if they weren't going to go through Stanley to make sure that postage had been paid. But we do see some items also cancelled that go further afield than Stanley that do receive the Afterglow cancel. Now, here's a memo from the government archives from March 1923. It's saying the postmaster had ordered what turned out to be the Oval Council from England. Uh, in the meantime, he would provide a John Bull type council posted on board HMCS Afterglow. And here's the only known cover that still exists uh, to Bleecker Island and uh, to Arthur Cobb there, and probably posted. Uh, from West Falkland. So it received the council and then dropped off at Bleecker Island, so never got to Stanley. And uh, talking of uh, famous naturalists, like we had Felton earlier, Cobb was a, an expert on birds as well. And of course, Cobb's Wren is named after him. So here's a, here's a cover, sent at the penny local rate. And you can see there's a number of uh, 
calculations on the bottom left hand side. Maybe it's a cal calculation of sheep, for example, but uh, that's the only known cover with the straight line after glow cancel. Now, here's the design for the cancel sent to uh, the GPO in London uh, by Craigie Hulkett. Uh, and you can see there, he, he basically used the old oval cancel and said HSCS after glow posted on board in the date. And there's a memo there also dated the 7th of July, 1923, stating that this oval cancel had arrived and attached to it is the first impression. You can see the clean impression there of the afterglow cancel, the 7th of July. It was postally used shortly afterwards. The first date we've got in our listing is the 29th of July, 1923, on a pair of war stamp pennies. That's the first example, I'd say 29th of July of, of the cancellation being used in 1923. <coughs> Now, this is a cover that's caused a lot of confusion, uh, the Bennett cover, and it's uh, ex uh, Rafe Riddle car, but also ex Cecil Neal's uh, collection. And it led to March 1923 being given as the original date, the earliest date of use of the cancel for many years. Now, I, th I think having seen all the information from the slide above, we know it the council didn't arrive until July 1923. So I think what we're looking at here is a deformed five or six uh, that looks like a three and uh, the reason why this March uh, date uh, was, was used, but it's definitely July, the first use of the uh, uh, Afterglow Oval Council. Interesting as well on the Bennett cover here, you can see it's actually unstamped. Uh, whether it's government business or not, we won't know, but uh, it uh, didn't receive a stamp, was still cancelled by the afterglow. Now, one question is, there isn't uh, a huge number of local or commercial afterglow covers. There are some for collectors. <coughs> now, did this come about due to the dealer Charles Davis. He was advertising in March uh, 20, 1923 here in the Falkland Islands Monthly Journal, uh, advertising buying used and unused postage stamps. I wonder if that explains the number of afterglow pieces that we see, especially those in 1923, and here's some 1923 examples, and why there are so few covers around that time because people were basically cutting off the stamps and selling them to Charles Davis. And it's interesting also, later on, you start to see Charles Davis covers as well. Maybe once he realized that there was this new cancellation, he was uh, speaking to his uh, friends in the Falkland Islands and getting some covers sent to him as well with the Afterglow uh, cancel. This means empire and local rate covers are pretty scarce, uh, but I'm going to show you a couple of empire covers. As they did go through Stanley Post Office, they could have received a cancel in Stanley, but they were posted on the Afterglow and were cancelled there and didn't then receive a further uh, Stanley cancellation. But as I said previously, it's nice to show some of these covers uh, with an advert alongside, and there's a Barrett and Co. Limited advert from the 1920s. I think it's January 1926 uh, to match the uh, cover, and it's the Foot Shape Works in Northampton. Uh, that uh, cover came from Feldman, I believe, in, in 2018. But a penny Empire rate being uh, cancelled uh, by being paid rather by a penny stamp there. Another example, this time the penny empire rate is paid by a couple of Haveney stamps, and it's to Groves and Lindley at Lion Buildings, Huddersfield. And they made uh, made to measure suits uh, through mail order. As you can see in their advert, it says overseas men's requirements specially studied. So I suspect what happened was you sent your order with your uh, details and back came a suit uh, to the colony. This is a February 1924 example, uh, as I say, the two Hayden is paying the rate. And that again is from the Peter Cottis sale of last year. 
Now, this is an interesting cover that uh, I originally got from Mike Roberts. Um, in 1926, there's some known cancellations of Afterglow with the spaced 1926. Cecil Neal wrote about these and said he thought they were spurious and unauthorised and were backdated cancels done later on. But the interesting thing about this cover is that there is a receiver on the back of Bridge of Weir. So 18th of August, 1926, the, the cancel, the afterglow cancel does uh, tie the block to the envelope. It's paying the correct Empire Penny rate plus threepence registration. It really does appear to be genuine with the type seven registration label. So it does look like there was official use of the space 1926 in, in July. Uh, with this cover providing good evidence for that. This is about the end period for the afterglow being uh, the mail ship uh, for inter-island mail in the Falklands. So what happened to the afterglow? Now, if you remember, I said she came as a sealing protection vessel, but she was purchased in 1929 to actually be a sealer. So she was actually a gamekeeper turned poacher and here was some, uh, one of the shares that was issued in 1928 for 50 pounds, which was perhaps raising capital to purchase the Afterglow from the short-lived Falkland Islands and Dependencies Sealing Company Limited. But that's what happened to the Afterglow uh, there. She became a sealer and she remained in the islands. She had a change of name at one point called Port Richard and then uh, went back in the, uh, the Second World War to be called Afterglow as well, when she was called up uh, for Navy service, and then finally founded in uh, 1944 or so, uh, and uh, was beached uh, just below the Market Gardens. And uh, until a few years ago, you could still see her boilers in the mud there. Uh, so a sad end to the Afterglow uh, career but uh, an interesting career and in she was both a sealing protection vessel and a sealer. Now, after the afterglow, the RMS Falkland came back into use and she was supplemented by other vessels, including occasionally even the afterglow herself carried mail again. What happened was the old posted on board cancel came back in uh, again, used without a date or ship being designated. And this is a, an item uh, that went to Roy Cove. There's a number of items to Clements at Roy Cove at the time, uh, but you might not recognize the name because it's not often used, Westbourne, no, the name of the house at Roy Cove. And there it is sent to Bertrand and Felton, Westbourne, West Falkland. And the final slide here is one of my favorites, which is Inter-Island Mail, cancelled in Fox Bay, January the 25th, 1930. And it's to the chief medical officer at the King Edwards Hospital in Port Stanley. And it makes a nice display page because I've put it with a contemporary postcard of King Edwards Hospital at the time. Pat simply paying the uh, penny rate as a, as a postal stationary envelope, but a very nice example of inter-island mail. And with that, we finish the uh, presentation. Thank you very much.